Okay, so uh, first of all, Ophelia, thank you so much for having this interview with me and with the rest of the people on the cluster. Um, the first question is, uh, could you tell me a little bit about your research and your role as a researcher? Um, so um, I consider myself an educator and the research comes second. Um, I like to study how language uh, happens in the classroom, but especially how students interact through language in classrooms. Um, I have spent probably my entire life uh, since I became a college graduate teaching, teaching first um, uh, children uh, in a progressive school, then um, teaching teachers at City College and then teaching researchers in the PhD program at the Graduate Center of City University of New York. So my research is about how um, language minoritized children are racialized through language um, and especially how bilingualism operates uh, in families, in communities, in uh, classrooms and focusing a lot on Latinx students. Okay, thank you. Um, what got you interested in what you research? My life experience. I was born in Cuba, came to New York City directly um, when I was 11 years old. I have a family that I'm the oldest of four, two were born in, the, in New York City. Um, uh, we always had a bilingual home. Uh, bilingualism was part of the ways in which we related to each other with my parents, with my siblings, with my neighbors and in a community that was mostly bilingual and Spanish speaking. Um, so I, it was my life experiences that led me to be interested in the ways that many bilingual children, bilingual students are misunderstood in schools and in society. Um, so that's what led me. Um, I was afterwards fortunate to have studied with Joshua Fishman um, and then to be uh, to have a mentor who was very generous and who always encouraged me to think on my own and uh, to learn from him, but to always make meaning out of my own experiences. So that's what led me. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, why does your study matters to the society? I think the study matters because I think, again, bilingualism has been completely misunderstood. I have a long career and I'm aged, and therefore I have seen how uh, the field has moved, how understandings have moved, but how limited those understandings continue to be. Um, it matters because uh, the way in which bilingual children are understood simply as two monolinguals in one uh, means that they're constantly compared uh, to monolingual white middle-class children, um, uh, that they cannot language in the same way. And therefore, I've always thought that we produce a failure by having those misunderstandings about bilingualism is. So uh, the translanguaging concept and the translanguaging research is about acknowledging the unitary repertoire that bilinguals ha uh, use um, uh, so that it's a unitary repertoire and therefore they really cannot be compared um, to white monolingual middle-class children unless you're taking the whole repertoire into account. Yeah, definitely. Um, what excites you the most about your work? What excites me the most is seeing young people who say all the time, and I've seen teachers say this, I've seen young scholars say this, oh, this is what we've always done, but we've never had a name for it. Um, and I think that's important and that's exciting. It's exciting that people realize that there are other ways of looking, ways that recognize um, the ways in which we have constructed language in ways that always minoritize certain people um, and how it empowers uh, people who start understanding the concept of a, having a unitary repertoire, how it empowers them to ask 
or I think um, creating a better society, creating some social justice and cognitive justice for these children in classrooms. Uh -huh. And this is the last question. Uh, there are undergrads and grad students coming to the symposium and they are showing any kind of interest in research and in the education as well. Uh, do you have any recommendation for them? Yeah, um, I think that my the strength of a researcher is their ability to observe with lenses that are their own and not lenses that come from theoretical frameworks that have nothing to do with what you're observing. Uh, you know, and I say this carefully because I know that all doctoral students are asked, what's your theoretical framework? Um, but I think unless you start by liberating yourself from theories that are handed down to us and start to create your own reality from your own data, and observe carefully and describe carefully, um, I think you cannot make new meaning. And then um, without that, what happens is you end up repeating um, other concepts, other research uh, that constrains us. And I really think we need to think carefully of um, the harm that some constraints in the academy have done by allowing us only to say what the literature has already said and allowing us only to look through lenses that have been produced in order to look at us as inferior uh, languages. And if you're going to liberate yourself from that, you have to learn to observe, the, uh, observe your participants, look at the data, describe it without any theoretical lens first, uh, because I think then you get a very different picture that does not emerge if you go into the data thinking that there is only one way of looking. Um, there are many ways of looking at data. There are many ways of looking at reality. Um, and we have to understand the silences that have been created through looking only through a lens that is approved uh, when that lens that is approved is one that does not allow us to see other realities. So that's, you know, that's always what I encourage my students to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay.